Welcome everyone, so pleased to see you all. I'm Mark Zuckerman, president of the Century Foundation. I want you to know that I wanna thank all of you for joining us today and thank the esteemed panel and the moderator. TCF is a progressive independent think tank that drives policy change to make people's lives better. Through the Bernard Schwartz Rediscovering Government Project led by Jeff Madrick, we have made addressing child poverty a priority. As you know, we had a major win recently with the expansion of the child tax credit in the American Rescue Plan. Our panel today will make the case for the adoption of a new poverty measure that is far more accurate. At this time, I wanna please welcome David, uh, David Brady, Professor and Director of the BUM Initiative at the University of California, Riverside. Thank you again for joining us and David, over to you. All right, thanks, Mark. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, everybody. And we'll just have a few slides to get us going today. And I hopefully won't take too long to, to do this presentation. We'll have plenty of time for these panelists that thank you very much panelists for being willing to do this. All right, so one of the things we wanna do with this report is to take a step back and really ask some big picture questions about how we should conceive of poverty. Even before we get into the nitty gritty of the measurement, let's just think clearly and clear headed about really what do we mean by poverty? All right, so let's start with some very, very simple, very fundamental definitions that hopefully can orient a productive discussion in terms of what it means to be poor. Okay. Now, my favorite definition of poverty is a very simple one, comes largely from Tim Smeeting, and that's to say that poverty is nothing more, nothing less than a shortage of resources relative to needs. Okay, we can debate what needs are, we can debate what resources are, but at the end of the day, that's really what we're interested in. You don't have enough resources to meet your needs. You don't have enough money or whatever it is that you need in terms of resources to make ends meet, okay? If we think of poverty in these very, very simple terms, the threshold is very simply the need standard. It's just how, what is the line at which your needs are met? At what point are you making ends meet? At what point are you meeting your needs? And thus, we're simply asking questions about how much resources are required to meet those needs. We haven't even gotten into what resources or needs mean, but we simply and clearly think of it this way. And I think it always helps just to clarify that's what we mean by poverty. You don't have enough resources, however defined, to meet needs, however defined, okay? Now, when we get into a relative measure of poverty, it also has a very, very simple logic. And this is one of the major reasons I would advocate for a relative measure is that it's clear, it's transparent, we understand what it is, all right? A relative measure, first and foremost, embraces the simple reality that our needs are always defined within a time and a place, okay? We always exist in a society. And one of the quotes I have in the report, I talk about Peter Townsend saying, you know, man is not Robinson Crusoe living on a desert island, right? And similarly, we think about our needs in terms of the American culture today, the American context today. I quote, um, you know, a scholar for saying that, you know, we wouldn't think of a medieval nobleman as the threshold of needs. We would think of people today families today. And we always have to be realistic that what we even think of and conceive of as a need reflects our culture, reflects our history, reflects our society in many ways. All right. A relative measure embraces this reality and it defines the needs as the prevailing standards of the contemporary society. Okay, whatever those prevailing standards are, and I give a concrete example to my students all the time, is that we might start to think of a prevailing standard as being having a smartphone, because it would be very, very difficult to apply for a job today without a smartphone. It'd be very difficult for your, your children to go to online schooling without a good internet connection. And it's crazy to think that we would have thought of those as the standards 20, 30, 40 years ago, but we certainly think of those as the prevailing standards of contemporary society. So the reason we often end up with this sort of the this sort of workhorse relative measure which is 50 percent of the median income is because that's always been viewed as a reasonable approximation of the prevailing standards of contemporary society so needs are always going to be relative there's no way to think of a need without thinking of the time and place in which you exist now i would go further and say resources also are defined relatively and one way i like to think about this is that say you have two income thresholds but in one state the state has expanded Medicaid under Obamacare. 
okay? A neighboring state has not expanded Medicaid under Obamacare. The same income levels across those states would not be consistent measures of resources because in the state without Obamacare's expansion, that family would have to go on the private market and use cash income to purchase health insurance. Whereas in a state where that's provided, at least for people up to 150% of the OPM, the, the very meaning of cash income, the very meaning of resources would reflect a different context, a different time and place. So even resources are defined relatively. Think of also about the big evolutions in social policy in the United States over recent decades. We used to be a society that had cash programs for low-income single mothers. Today, we don't really have that program anymore. TANF is just a shadow of what AFDC was. And instead, we use near cash vouchers like food stamps or SNAP. And we also use tax credits like crazy. And so the very net notion of what it means to have resources reflects the time and place. And our social policies evolving show how resources change over time. Now, another clear advantage of a relative measure is that we end up with a reasonable threshold. If we embrace the reality that needs are defined within a time and place and resources are even defined, with, uh, defined within a time and place, we end up with a reasonable threshold, okay? So if we use a standard relative measure, about $34,000 would be needed for a family of three in 2018. And that's a reasonable threshold. It makes a lot more sense to draw the line there and it more realistically approximates that need standard, what families need to make ends meet than does the OPM or some of the other measures. So right off the bat, the best argument for relative measure is that it's simple, it's clear, and it ends up with a reasonable threshold. Now beyond that, I point out one of the points of this report was to try to illustrate and demonstrate all the problems with absolute measures. And they're deeply problematic. Um, I'm certainly probably of the camp that Tim Sweden just talked about is there's no such thing as an absolute measure. I would probably go that far. And the reason is once you sort of scratch at and dig into what these absolute measures mean, they're really hard to defend. They don't make a lot of sense. So let's think about what an absolute measure is. First of all, it implies you have a timeless and uniform set of needs. It means that if it's 1900, 1950, 2000, 2020, there's some needs that we can all agree upon that transcend time and place, okay? So your threshold, because that's your need standard, gets fixed regardless of time and place. And so it implies, even if you think about it, if we really believed in absolute measures, we wouldn't even do cost of living adjustments. And that's preposterous, right? Of course it costs different things in different places, okay? Now, some of the concrete problems with absolute measures include the following. First of all, an absolute measure really is hard to define in an absolute sense above subsistence. So we can all agree a family should have enough resources to clothe itself, feed itself, have clean water, have adequate heat if it's a cold place. Of course, we can agree with those subsistence standards, but any threshold above subsistence it's a hard to rely, define reliably, okay? So we can agree, yeah, families should be able to subsist, but is that the only way we should think of poverty in a modern society that's as affluent as the United States? So what happens, because we can't define these need standards reliably above subsistence, we end up with all these arbitrary and silly thresholds that really can't be defended. So let's look at two concrete examples that I talk about in the report. The easiest one is the OPM, okay? And it exemplifies these problems. And I only briefly discussed the OPM in the report because Sean Fremstad wrote this master class report on the OPM just last year that was so compelling, so convincing. It's a terrific teaching resource. I don't need to cover it, I hope, okay? But the basic idea of the OPM, really, when you strip away some of the fancy language, it's basically saying the needs of mid-1950s households. That's the needs we need to meet, okay? There's no allocation for childcare, really healthcare is not really factored in. There's this huge assumption that food times three was basically the need standards of households. There's all kinds of sort of chicanery in the background. It's really questionable, but at the end of the day, they're saying the needs of mid-1950s households are a good need standards for today. Also, the definition of resources does not reflect that relative evolution of social policy over time. So it never included near cash transfers like SNAP. It never included taxes and tax credits like the EITC, the CTC. One of the ways I point out that the OPM is absurd is that all the efforts of President Biden and the, the Congress to expand the child tax credit would be omitted by the OPM. It wouldn't register with the OPM because it doesn't factor in tax credits. 
Now, as we all know, the OPM also ends up with absurd thresholds. They're way too low. Families cannot make ends meet on these thresholds. And I would advise anyone that teaches to you know, play a game with your students where you tell them, let's do a budget. Here's the OPM threshold. Here's what a family would have every month and do the calculations on making needs or making ends meet. And you find families just cannot make it on the OPM threshold. Now, another example of a deeply problematic absolute measure would be the recent measure that came about by Bruce Meyer and James Sullivan that they did in collaboration with the Trump's Council of Economic Advisors and the American Enterprise Institute, okay? And I would say this is even worse, okay? Basically, the way they define needs, and you really have to dig into the article because as is the case, absolute measures are rarely transparent they're rarely simple, they're very rarely clear. But if you dig into their report, what they're basically saying is the threshold should be set and the needs are defined as the 13th percentile of consumption spending in 1980. That's their threshold. Why are we using that threshold? There's no sort of acknowledgement of the time and the place of 2021. Instead, they're saying the 13th percentile, however much money was being spent at the 13th percentile in 1980, that's the threshold. That's what we define as needs. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. So they end up with this threshold that says, if you're making $13,000 for a family of four in 2018, you're not poor. And that shows you just how absurd some of these absolute thresholds are. Now, beyond these critiques, the absolute measures and the advantages of the simplicity and clarity of a relative measure, I'll just make a couple points about why relative measures are superior. And that's the, that's the bulk of the report is trying to make the affirmative case for relative measures, okay? If a measure of poverty is good, it should predict health, well-being, and life chances. Okay, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of a March Ascends view is that poverty is not low well-being per se. Poverty is the inability to purchase well-being. You don't have the resources to meet those needs. Meeting your needs is the well-being. So if you don't have enough resources, that means you can't purchase that well-being on the market. So a good poverty measure should be able to predict things we care about in terms of well-being. And then poverty measures that best predict well-being and health and life chances should be the preferred measure. Now, we don't have great evidence on this, but we have a little bit of evidence that are reviewing the report. And the best evidence we have is that a relative measure better or even best predicts health, well-being, and life chances. And in the report, I allude to this recent working paper that I'm doing with Rich Carpiano and Michaela Curran. And we show in this report that relative income is a much better predictor of various measures of health and well-being versus absolute income. Okay, and we can talk if you want Q&A about how we measure these things, but we follow all the conventions and all the standards of how you should do this. And when it comes to self-rated health, poor health, psychological distress, having high psychological distress, or even simply feeling that your life is satisfying, relative income is a dramatically better predictor of this than is absolute income, which is prima facie evidence that relative poverty is gonna better predict it than absolute poverty. But we do need more research on this issue. Beyond that, I talk at length in the paper about the theory and conceptualization of poverty. All the evidence I see is that all of our theoretical definitions and conceptualization of poverty, they point us towards relative measures. They do not point us towards absolute measures. And one of my favorite examples of this, of course, is Adam Smith, who said that you're poor if you can't meet the custom of the country for appearing in public without shame. And that was a profound definition to say, you need to be able to appear in public without shame. And the custom of the country renders who's poor, not some absolute standard. And Adam Smith wrote that back in 1776. Adam Smith gave the example that being able to afford a linen shirt and assume 18th century Scotland, this was a marker of being able to appear in public without shame. And so all of the leading conceptual definitions, when we think about what it means to be poor, social exclusion, capability deprivation, relative deprivation, all of the leading theoretical definitions point us towards relative measures. And finally, like I've tried to sort of hammer home today, I think the best case for the relative measure is its honesty and transparency, okay? We know that we don't really know exactly what the needs of a family are, so we just concede. The needs are the prevailing standards of the contemporary society. And we admit that no one threshold is gonna be perfect, but we admit that 50% of the median income is a good approximation of the prevailing standards of a given society. And moreover, like I said, we always need to be aware that resources are always relative. Like I said, if I'm a low-income family, I'd much rather live in a state that expands Obamacare or under Obamacare expanded Medicaid. That's going to 
make a huge difference as opposed to having to use that cash income to buy health insurance on the private market. And that acknowledges that context is always going to matter how we define poverty. So finally, in sum, I would say that a relative measure is more honest, it's more transparent, it's straightforward, and this is the best case we've got for a relative measure of poverty. And I'll be able to turn it over to my panelists at this point. David, I think I'm going to pick it up. It's Jeff okay. Madrick. Uh, I apologize to the audience. I don't think you're going to be able to see me. There's something wrong with my screen. I hope to see you all at some future date. That was excellent, <laughs> David. What you didn't mention is how many nations already use the relative poverty measure of low income. Uh, most of Europe, or at least the OECD, any comment on that before I go to other people? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an easy argument. Um, a, one good argument for a relative measure is just that it would get us more consistent with how every other rich democracy measures poverty. That's a good point, absolutely. So uh, I, I, let me welcome the audience again and thank you very much for participating in this. We at Rediscovering Government uh, believe measuring poverty is a vital issue. We believe the official poverty measure is not only nonsense, but highly unethical. And, and as David suggested, poverty is an ambiguous notion. In fact, some advocates uh, don't think we should use the word poverty. We should use the words low income to talk about the same thing. We have an all-star cast, uh, and I don't exaggerate, and they have lots to say on this issue. Rebecca Vallis, senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Carolyn Barnes, assistant professor of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke. Emma Marabi, director of poverty policy at the Children's Defense Fund. And Sean Fremstad, senior policy fellow at the Center for Economic and Policy Research and a co-sponsor of this webinar. I hope we mentioned this at the top. Uh, we're sponsoring this together. So thank you, Sean. Rebecca, uh, I'm gonna ask the, the panelists to comment pro or con and uh, all shades in between about David's proposal. So Rebecca, let's start with you. Thanks so much, Jeff. And thank you, David. And the paper is terrific. It's um, incredibly uh, important and timely. And um, I also just want to give another plug for Sean Fremstad's paper in this same series, which for folks who are looking to learn more and maybe are newer to what is this debate around uh, a relative poverty measure, um, I would strongly suggest also reading Sean's paper um, as, as a really important, I think, counterpart with, with David's excellent paper. I'm going to make three key points, and then I know we're going to have more time to get into discussion as well. Um, and so I, I'm going to aim to be brief. The first thing that I will say is just to overridingly agree with the sort of lead argument um, that, that David has made here in which you, Jeff, just endorsed with uh, your rediscovering government hat on. And that is that our official poverty measure, which is known as the OPM, our official poverty measure in this country has done such a poor job of capturing what it actually costs to afford a basic standard of living that it vastly undercounts who is poor in America. And I'll offer one sort of case in point here. According to the OPM, pre-COVID pandemic, about 10 to 12 percent of Americans were counted as being officially poor in the years prior to the pandemic. And at the same time, roughly half of U.S. households Households were struggling to afford food and housing and health care and child care and, and other basics, according to another measure by the United Way known as ALICE that looks at families who are asset limited and income constrained and therefore live above that federal OPM, but who still struggle to afford the basics. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll also look at another sort of validator of how poor a job the OPM is doing, which is public opinion. It doesn't take fancy measures to tell us what a poor job job the OPM does of capturing who's struggling to make ends meet, the American people themselves agree that the OPM is wildly out of touch with reality. And that's according to public opinion research, asking where do Americans think that the poverty line should be? Uh, in 2013, the Center for American Progress, my previous think tank alma mater, sponsored a survey asking Americans, where do you think that the poverty line is for a family of four in America today? And Americans said that back in 2013, they thought that the poverty line um, would be around $30,000 on average for a family of four. Um, and, and if you don't want to take it from the Center for American Progress, you can take it from the American Enterprise Institute. An AEI poll in 2016 
um, asked a very similar question, um, and and they they found an even higher number. Their their uh, response was um, was around thirty two thousand um, uh, dollars on average, and that was in in twenty sixteen, and that's about twenty seven percent higher than the official poverty measure, which would set um, a family as being counted as poor if they had about $24,000 for a family of four. The second key point that I'll make is that the need, um, there's a need to understand poverty, not only as a shortage of research, resources relative to need, as David described, but also as a form uh, of and, and driver of social exclusion. And David, you mentioned that briefly, but I think this is so important to lift up. Um, David's paper does a great job of reviewing the social exclusion literature, which explores how the inability to afford certain minimum necessities results in exclusion from what constitutes normal daily life and a, a basic standard of living, whether that be access to the internet or clothes to be able to get a good job or access to decent housing and education and so forth. David quotes uh, Hillary Silver, in the paper in noting that social exclusion is essentially the opposite of solidarity. And I find this to be an incredibly powerful link. In this way, poverty is not only about dollars and cents, it's also about marginalization and isolation from the broader community. So as we think about moving to a relative measure of poverty, that would be in keeping in many ways with an approach that centers our common humanity and which reinforces solidarity as a goal and the economic and social freedom and and human dignity that, that can come and that do come with not being poor versus otherization or the us and them mindset that allows some in this country to think out of sight, out of mind, or, or to engage in policy making that's about other people, I put in large scare quotes, rather than people who are part of an us. And the third and final point that I'll make in, in just this quick reactions point um, of the discussion is um, is is to say you know why why does this conversation matter it's it's a fairly wonky subject a lot of folks might be going relative poverty what are we even talking about and I, I want to ask the question why does it even matter how we measure poverty and so to that end in answering that question I would say well what is the goal in measuring poverty ostensibly it's not about knowing how many people fall below some arbitrary threshold that bears no resemblance to what it actually costs to afford a basic standard of living. And similarly, when we set goals around, you know, quote unquote, lifting people out of poverty or protecting people from poverty, the goal there ostensibly isn't about bringing people above some arbitrary line for the sake of making the math work. Meanwhile, by defining poverty down over the years, which is what the OPM has done, it has not only understated what has actually been long-term widespread and rising economic insecurity, it's, it's also distorted public awareness and public opinion around who the so-called poor are, reinforcing, again, an otherizing us and them narrative that paints the poor in capital letters as broken people instead of it, poverty as a widespread experience resulting from a broken economy. Um, and so I'll close by saying that a relative measure where poverty is defined as less than half or, or 60 percent of the median income, for example, as other uh, developed nations generally uh, measure poverty, would not only transform how we measure poverty in America, but would also have the potential to spur a major shift in the conversation around poverty, such that instead of asking how many people's incomes fell below some arbitrary dollar threshold that has nothing to do with what it costs to afford a basic standard of living today, we would be asking how many people have incomes that are too low to afford a basic standard standard of living in the here and now. That's a much more meaningful and relevant question, I would hope we can all agree, which then would set us up to evaluate various public policy options that can actually protect adults as well as children from poverty defined meaningfully. And I look forward to getting into all of this more in the discussion. Carolyn, all how right. are you? I'm great. Maybe on to David and uh, Rebecca, if you care to, and the issues that have been raised, or wow. make your own points, of course. <laughs> um, I, I agree with Rebecca and, and David's points um, that were so eloquently stated. Uh, David, thank you so much for writing this report and for your convincing case on why we should abandon the official measure of poverty for a relative measure 
um, a measure that captures resources relative to needs within a geographical, historical, and cultural context. I'm really curious, and I hope that we get to talk about this in uh, the q and I'm curious about the intersection between a relative measure of poverty and racial disparities in living conditions, health, and well-being outcomes. So you emphasize the need to ensure that people are living in conditions that reflect the customary standards of the majority of contemporary societies or in the communities in which they live. But we've got a lot of evidence that suggests that there are really wide glaring racial disparities in employment, housing insecurity, home ownership, and health and wealth. Now I can imagine that um, capturing social exclusion through this relative measure, which you define as marginalization and isolation from one's community or incomplete disadvantage of access to status benefits and experiences typical of citizens in society, that social exclusion measure might help us um, get at racism. But I worry that uh, a relative measure that focuses on this threshold of median income might mute how racism affects access to resources or how racism shapes policymakers and administrators definitions of need. One of the things I've become increasingly sensitive to is the politicized and racialized nature of the official measure of poverty. Not only is it outdated and ill-equipped to capture needs, but over time it's become a politicized tool to determine deservingness and to deter dependency on the state. Now this has especially been the case as women of color, in particular black women, have publicly been, been portrayed as the face of poverty. And what that's led to are means tested programs um, being hard, hard, harder to access and more punitive and less generous. And within all of this, the official measure of poverty has become a tool to deny resources to vulnerable families. So um, I guess my comment slash question slash response is if we ever move towards a relative measure of poverty, how, if at all, can we insulate this measure from becoming racialized in ways that reproduce patterns of racial inequality? And how can a relative measure of poverty address current racial disparities in resources and living conditions? And I'll leave that at there. Carolyn, thanks very much. This issue about media coverage of poor, the poor is, well, a lot of issues, I suppose, by now are close to my heart. But when you look at the media coverage, and I talk about this in my book, Invisible Americans, um, at, in the 1960s, black people were used to portray poverty in all the major media almost all the time. And of course, we know they accounted for something like half the poor or even less in some cases. So uh, the media since then, and I think still today in some of the great publications of our time, including the New York Times, have a lot to account for. So. That's an important subject. I just want to re-emphasize it. Uh, Emma Marabi of the Children's Defense Fund. I already introduced you. I'm sure you have lots to talk about. Yes, and also want to be mindful of time and how everyone is, um, what Rebecca and, and Professor Barnes always said. I, to, you know, a first reaction to David's um, report is that it, I think it lays a very strong case for why we need a relative measure and it's a great compliment to Sean's report as Rebecca as noted is in the chat, you know, um, that a relative measure is in so many ways much more closely defined and reflected to our society's needs and the standards of living in the United States that obviously vary tremendously between neighborhood and neighborhood in your community. And if you live maybe in a rural part of America or in a, an urban part. And I think we can all agree, at least in my mind, um, for these panelists that um, you know, our existing poverty measurement doesn't capture too many, but too few of the children and families who are struggling to make ends meet. Um, as I was thinking about the report and, and reacting to some of the conversations in the report, particularly on well-being and how we just further define how poverty and child, particularly for the Children's Defense Fund with child well-being, um, I think it touched on that example um, and how, how it produces harm and violence and undermines well-being. Um, but I also think a, a further discussion and um, conversation is needed on why those two are actually so deeply connected. Us purchasing or, you know, 
children or families purchasing or pursuing well-being, but it's actually intertwined to a child's lifelong health, right? And they're building blocks of brain. And so as I think about it, um, you know, positive early experiences do provide children with really that lifelong foundation, right? It provides them the building blocks, the health, well-being in the future, um, which in turn helps their skills and their learning capacities throughout their lifespan. Um, and so in my mind, I think we need to better connect the basics of well-being that are uniquely connected to child poverty and how uh, well-being can in turn impact uh, a child's life. And so I think of it kind of as three things, um, a stable nurturing environment with relationships with nurturing adults. So those who have secure attachments to an adult or a caregiver that's caring for them, um, safe, supportive, healthy homes and neighborhoods free of environmental toxins, and then appropriate health and nutrition and education. And in my mind, um, those really early health indicators are so not just a private responsibility of parents, and I think you kind of touched upon this in your report, David, um, but they're really, collect they are, and they should be, um, probably not as, as well-defined or well-narrated um, in society, but really should be the responsibility of all of us, um, both as our neighbors, our community members, and the like. And just a few examples, and then I'll turn it back to you. Um, I think of it kind of in this way, um, you know, it means if you have these three kind of health indicators, it also means that you have, you might have supportive family members, quality early childhood program staff. Um, you may have access to uh, better financial and psychological support and institutional resources like your kid may be able to be able to go to a park or they may be able to have really good after school programs or they may have those cash supports that you kind of touched upon in your presentation, um, whether they're tax credits or they're the expanded CTC. Um, so when you lay it, I think when you further talk about them as more connected, you can even start debunking the notion that these are all individual factors contributing to, po to poverty and individual failing and more as how are these two things connected and how are they government and societal responsibilities to ensure the next generation has what they need to flourish and thrive. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Jeff and look forward to more discussion. And I, I will turn it over to Sean from C EPR, who is uh, people have mentioned, has written very effectively for our organization, for both of ours, uh, on these subjects. I think I, I would. I just have to mention Amartya Sen's capabilities literature and some of his co-authors that uh, poor kids need to be given the capabilities to have an opportunistic life. But let me uh, let me shift over to Sean. Uh, and Sean, comments about David and everybody else? Sure. Um, well, thank you so much for having me on. This is a terrific uh, report, David, and, and terrific comments from everybody. Uh, I wanted to say something about the word relative, right? Which I think, I think there's a branding issue here. Like to some American ears, I think relative just sounds too different, you know, too European. It's like, you know, <laughs> post-structuralist or something. And it's really, you know, uh, so I think it's really important just to stress how normal this approach is, right? We could call it the normal concrete approach to poverty measurement or something. I mean, not going to be easy, you know, probably won't work. I mean, you know, social scientists have their terms, but um, it's really just saying, you know, when we say relative, we're just saying compared to the here and now, this time and place, you know, this kind of, you know, reference. Um, and so a relative poverty measurement is just one that measures poverty in a way that's anchored to our place and time. United States in 21st century America, not 1960s America. One of my favorite quotes that I always like to bring up in poverty measurement to give you a sense of how non-normal the current OPM is, the current official poverty measure, is um, comes from Molly Orshansky. So she was the, the Social Security Administration um, staffer who really was responsible for developing the measure. This was back in literally the early 1960s. She was using 1959 roughly consumption data to put this together. And as she wrote back then, this poverty measure assumes a quote, careful shopper, skillful cook, and a good manager who will prepare all the family meals at home. So basically the idea was every American with, you know, has a stay at home wife um, to, to take care of, of, you know, their cooking and their cleaning and household management. And I think, you know, in the here and now, that's not normal America anymore. We don't prepare all our meals at home. We don't expect all this sort of household knowledge and that we have, um, you know, quote unquote, a wife to like take care of those needs. 
Um, so I think part of this is just, you know, modernizing and updating and recognizing um, that um, things have changed. Um, so, you know, again, just, you know, it's a normal way to measure poverty. It's a normal 21st century way. Um, I just want to share a few quick thoughts on some very specific um, steps that I think the Biden administration census and the current Congress could take to move toward, you know, a more modern, normal, relative kind of um, set of poverty measures. First of all, every September, the Census Bureau publishes a report that uses the OPM, the official poverty measure, to say um, how many Americans are poor. Last year, President Trump um, touted that report to claim that poverty had reached a historic low as a result of his presidency. Um, and of course, as, as David has noted, um, you know, that's ridiculous. It's not a, you know, no longer a valid measure. We shouldn't be, you know, letting the next President Trump point to that measure to say they've um, achieve this historic progress on poverty. Um, so I think it's really something I think, and partly I think people working at the Census Bureau, serious, sober career staffers should think, you know, can we be holding this out as official, as an accurate measure of quote unquote poverty in 2021? And I think there's a kind of, you know, this goes to places like the National Academy of Sciences too. I think there's a real responsibility here not to mislead the public. And so either I would say we should, you know, the Census Bureau should stop publishing those quote unquote official measures um, using that outdated poverty line, or they should, you know, do some truth in labeling and they should say, this is a, you know, poverty measure anchored in 1963. To the extent, you know, other countries will report um, uh, poverty numbers using thresholds that are anchored at some point in the past, um, like the official measure here, but they're very clear and transparent about it. They'll say this is, you know, this base measure was set in 1960, um, free and we haven't changed it since then except for inflation. And so I think that would just be a very, you know, transparent, um, reasonable thing to say, and it would be, you know, doing the public a favor. Um, second, the Census Bureau publishes a report that uses what's called the supplemental poverty measure. And there's been some discussion of it here. That is a much better measure in so many respects. It's still not really, it's a somewhat relative measure, but I think it's not really a true relative measure in the way we're talking about here. And that it, it's still set very low um, I think there hasn't been the kind of, again, transparent sort of public discussion of where you need to set that threshold. And so I'd really urge the administration to review the SPM, to review the income thresholds, to, you know, to decide, are these thresholds, uh, is this poverty line that we set using the SPM um, relative to the prevailing standards of our time? And they should be transparent about it, provide a public rationale for wherever they decide to set them, and there should be an opportunity for the public to comment on that. I, th I think that's just very, you know, sort of like, again, you wanna have something that's relative to today and you wanna have actual people able to say, you know, what they think about it. And then finally, I would say in annual reports on income poverty, um, the census should just get in the habit of using a, you know, 50% of median income or 60% of median income threshold and say how many Americans are below this threshold. You know, if they don't wanna call it poverty, that's fine with me actually, cause I think, you know, it's kind of, you know, if they want to call it low income because we haven't figured out exactly where we want to set the poverty line, fine. But I think you want to get to this idea, this is how many Americans are falling this far behind um, the middle. So you're really getting this idea of, you know, we're trying to move together a, as a country, how many of our people are falling, you know, are only at half um, of what the middle or 60%. Um, and when you look at those measures, you know, I, I looked at these closely this morning or uh, quickly this morning, if you use 60% of median, which is uh, what the United Kingdom uses, it would mean 28% of um, US children fall below that threshold or below 60% um, of median. If you use 50%, it would be 20% of all children. So again, I think a much more accurate gives you both, I think of those give you a much more accurate sense of what we really think about, you know, what is the percentage of children uh, who are falling um, behind um, and that we need to be really thoughtful about. Um, uh, so um, I'll just I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to kind of use up um, more time. Uh, thanks. Okay, Sean, thank you very much. So Sean's proposed some uh, action. Uh, we I want to give everybody a chance to comment again. My main question is, what should we do? Uh, Sean already commented on that. David, uh, how do we get there? Rebecca, I already mentioned to Rebecca. I was going to ask her early on. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for conversation. That's the nature of this beast. But make your key points, please. Uh, 
David, did you want to make a point on yeah, this? I'll make a couple points. Um, and, you know, I've argued that a relative measure is transparent and simple. And it's just unfortunate. Jeff is not being transparent by not showing us his camera on. You know, Jeff is <laughs> also very shady and questionable. You're this shadowy figure that we don't just a voice. I don't know. It's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so a couple things. One is that with, I, you know, I'm completely have drunk Sean's Kool-Aid. I think the OPN is absurd. We should discontinue it. As Jeff says in his wonderful book, uh, he says, you know, it's one of the most dishonest measures the government reports. And so I feel like we should abandon that. I am with also with Sean and thinking the SPM is not that great. And I would point out, though, we, we dress up the SPM with all this fanciness. The bottom line is the SPM is just a relative measure. It is. It's a relative measure because it's based on the 33rd percentile consumption spending. That's the gist of it. Then there's these adjustments, right? They say, well, 1.2 times that. And then we have the cost of living adjustments. And everyone, everyone doesn't really understand these adjustments. You know what I mean? Basically, they're so mm. confusing and opaque and mysterious. So let's admit what the SPM is. It's a bad relative measure, okay? And what I mean by bad is just that it's like, why are we tying to consumption? Where is the evidence that consumption is so well measured and that consumption surveys are a better way to measure people's resources than income surveys? That evidence actually doesn't exist despite the many proclamations that consumption is good. So A, that. One is that I'm not a huge fan of the SPM. Uh, it's better than the OPM, indisputably, of course. But let's be honest, the SPM is a relative measure. It's just not as good of a relative measure. So I would say abandon the OPM, use the SPM, but know it's weak in some ways, and always publish a relative measure. Now, to the point that I think it's particularly is underlying is Carolyn's point is that what would this show us in racial inequalities? And I think this is absolutely crucial. So I actually have a paper with Regina Baker, Dedrick Williams, Zach Carolyn under review, where we look at racial inequalities and poverty definitively with the best data with a couple different measures. And surprisingly, you don't see a big, uh, the, 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 the poverty gap, if you will, between say blacks and whites doesn't change depending on the measure that much. But so under pretty much all the good measures, SPM, relative measure, blacks are about twice as likely to be poor as white people. Latinos are about twice as likely to be poor as white people, okay? So that, that doesn't change a lot, but millions more poor people will be counted and millions more African-American people, millions more Latino people would be counted if you move the threshold up. The final point I'll say is again, an argument for the relative measure is the transparency. And if we want transparency, that means we measure resources as comprehensively as possible, okay? And I would argue when you measure resources as comprehensively as possible, you're gonna find more racial inequality because access to resources is always racialized. There's always racial discrimination. One concrete example, and then I'll stop is to now, say- David, let me, let me move on to other people. That, okay. That's clear and it's a very good point. So I wanna get everybody to get, a, uh, to get a chance to comment on this. So Rebecca? Uh, you want to comment on these points? And I want Carolyn to comment on the uh, racial disparities, of course, and our other panelists. Emma needs some more time also. Sure, uh, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very brief so that others can, can weigh in as well. Um, I, Sean Fremstead is correct. We need to reject and abandon the official poverty measure. And that is that is absolutely the takeaway, I think, from this conversation for, for, um, for policymakers. Um, I, I, at the same time, um, I wanna put in a plug that as we design a relative measure that, that uh, I think Sean is exactly right. And I think the way I'm gonna start referring to it is as we shift to measuring poverty in the here and now, as opposed to with an arbitrary arbitrary threshold that has no resemblance to what it actually costs to afford a basic standard of living today in this society. Um, I, I, I want to put in a plug that um, as we design that measure, that it not be something that is solely designed by think tanks, by folks in the ivory tower, by, by folks who are all well-intentioned, but who are using pie charts and statistics and, um, and research as their basis. It, it needs to be a process that also engages and learns from people who themselves are struggling to make ends meet right now. And that is that is 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 going to be an incredibly important source of information in understanding how we capture what it costs to afford a basic standard of living. What are those things that we need to be measuring? What is it that it requires access to today in the here and now to be able to be part of society, fully participating in society and to lead a fully dignified life uh, with the benefit of, of economic freedom? Um, 
and so that's, that's me putting in a plug for it, not just to be the ivory tower crew who are part of this conversation of design. I'll leave it. Let me, uh, let me move on to Carol, Carolyn, but I will say one quick thing. Uh, researchers in America hardly ever talk to poor children about what it's like to be poor. Researchers in England and other places in Europe talk to children often about what it's like not to have enough food and so forth. But Carolyn, let me move to you. Are you there? Okay. Carolyn? Actually, I'm going to yield my time to. No, no, no. no don't okay. want to I, well, we just want, I just want to have time for Q&A. But I guess my response to, to David, um, we can capture more of um, uh, more of uh, more disparities in terms of resources. My concern is how a different measure is going to shape administration and implementation, especially given um, federalism and and how we sort of devolved a lot of authority and discretion over to states and and counties in some some parts of America that's led to a lot of inequality in the generosity and accessibility of means tested programs so I could imagine a southern less uh, generous um, less well-off state um, using that relative measure in ways that harms uh, African American families. I'm thinking, I mean, the state of North Carolina is a, um, it, it, depending on how we want to define geographic location and context, you know, east of 95 is very poor. <laughs> So are we doing county? Are we doing neighborhood? Especially when you think about racial segregation and housing patterns, like I can see the relative measure concentrating poverty more than the official poverty measure, depending on whose hands it gets into and how it's used to determine eligibility and um, access to programs. Um, Emma, uh, good point. You have to talk to us, uh, Carolyn, about how to get what you want, but, but let me go to Emma. Sure. Um, I think if the original question was a call to action. So, so much of what Rebecca said, we need to engage those with lived experiences and need to be part of the process at the front end. Um, that means not just talking to families on the ground, but engaging in grassroots organizations. Um, and then two, we need to make sure that um, any asks that we have are engaged from um, the ground up. So there's a movement to actually change this. This is not going to be changed. Our poverty measurements and what um, Carolyn was mentioning program eligibility, which are connected, but could be changed at different times. I know we didn't get to get into that discussion, but we need to make clear that um, our asks are a movement building ask and not just an ask coming from Washington, D.C. folks. Um, we also need to make sure our asks are just really clear and succinct if we're sending information to the Biden administration or to Congress. We need to make make it very targeted. And then fourth, um, we need to be able to connect how the poverty measurement is or is not connected to program eligibility, which Carolyn alluded to, but we didn't get into that full conversation um, at the beginning of this call. Thank you. Uh, is it time for us to go to the audience, Ellie, or are we on schedule? Yeah, we've got some audience questions we can go to. Um, the first one is that a big benefit of SPM thresholds is that they vary by geography, recognizing that cost of living and therefore need differs throughout the country. David, are you saying that there should be national thresholds that are relative? Same threshold for New York City as for rural Mississippi? Yeah, great question. And there was a bunch of people that asked, should the threshold be local, national, or global? And this directly dovetails with Carolyn's concern. So imagine you're in a very poor neighborhood or poor community, would the threshold be much lower? And would that then create exacerbate racial inequalities given the residential segregation of peoples across the United States? Um, I would say, I think this is a great question. And I think this is a, the question that should be the source of democratic debate. I would not impose a decision on this. I would say we should be debating this. And that would be great if we're debating that issue. But the minute we're doing this, we relative measures have won. Okay, if we're going to debate exactly where the line is set and what means prevailing standards of our time and place, the here and now, as Sean says, I'm open to the debate on where the best way to draw that is, but then let's admit we're doing a relative measure. And that's so I sort of am willing to win the big picture argument for the here and now and the prevailing standards and let uh, many of us debate the precise way to define the here and now and the prevailing standards, whether that's global, national or local. 
Any other comments on that issue? Can I, yeah, I, I think this is great. And I, I think, you know, this, some of the questions around geography and race, there's so, there's so much there that it, it really, um, it'd be great to have another two or three hours on this, but yeah. um, on geography, I think, you know, one of the issues and race too, it is an issue with, so with the supplemental poverty measure, um, because I think, and it goes back to the fact that they don't really set the, the main national threshold high enough, there are actually places in the country that have a lower supplemental poverty um, line <laughs> than right. um, the current official poverty line. And it's a lot, and it includes places like in the rural um, South, in, the, um, um, in very poor areas. And I think that is um, a real problem. Um, and um, the other issue, I think, with the supplemental poverty measurement from a racial perspective, it is it, last time I checked, it actually because of you know, some of the ways the pieces work together, it increases the number of white people um, who are poor, but reduces the number of black people who are poor. And you know, there may be you know, valid reasons for that within the mechanism, but I kind of think the over, it, it strikes me as just kind of being off um, in a way um, that, um, especially when it kind of, it still has a very low number in terms of the overall rate. Um, I think these issues on geography, I mean, part of the, Part of the issue, well, part of what we have to think about is um, we need a measure that identifies poor places and sets a kind of goal. You know, how do you lift, you know, this place is poor relative to the national standard. And that doesn't mean they should just have a, you know, a similarly poor threshold that we kind of define down the threshold. And there may not be an easy way to do it. I think it's the kind of thing we need to do a lot more thinking about. Maybe you have both. Um, you know, there's some been some work on this in Europe where they use kind of both. Um, a national threshold and a place specific threshold. And then they, you know, have their both goals kind of operating at the same time. Yeah, and I, I would just add, if I could, um, I would not go too local because um, sort of as alluded to by Carolyn, you know, one of the capabilities Absolutely. we want resources for is to be able to not live in a in an unsafe or polluted neighborhood, right? So mm -hmm. avoiding toxins seems like a perfectly reasonable, you know, a well-being to purchase. And if we set the thresholds just based on your neighborhood, for example, you might do well within a very, very poor neighborhood, but that sort of removes the capacity or the capability to move out of a poor neighborhood and move into a neighborhood that's safer and healthier and what have you. So- David, let, let's try to go to another question, another audience question. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So another question we have is, what is the panel's opinion on the accuracy and utility of, of measures of poverty and need that have been developed, such as United Way's ALICE threshold, the self-sufficiency standard, and New York City's CEO measure? What are key metrics you look at to compare such measures? So who would like to answer that? I think, uh, Emma, do you want to answer that? Didn't you talk about that? Rebecca talked about the Alice one. I mean, I used the, and I will now defer to Rebecca, but I use the um, CPI's family self-sufficiency calculator like pretty frequently. And I, I think the last estimate was that a family of four with two children in Washington, D.C. needed like $105,000 to like make, meet basic needs, which is like, I, would, mm -hmm. I think it's four times the official poverty measure, but I'll let, so I use it. So the, to answer your question, I use it. I think there's other ones, Georgetown, has a similar one. Um, I, I know Insight Center has, has another one, but I will defer to also to Rebecca because I know she was on who brought up Alice. So Rebecca? I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I, I actually find them to be much more helpful and much more accurate than the official poverty measure. It's not to say that any one of them is perfect or, or stands in as, as the substitute that, ooh, there's no more work that needs to be done, no more research, no more debate, no more um, talking with, with folks who are experiencing uh, what it, it is like to not meet basic needs uh, in, in the here and now today. Um, but I do find all of them to be um, a lot closer to what it actually costs to afford a basic standard of living. And I particularly Really like the Alice measure in that it's a nice complement to some of the cost of living measures in that it actually helps us track um, uh, the, the share of families who are not able to afford certain things that we have all agreed on are, 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 are basics, um, like food, housing, health care, child care. It starts to get into those specific basics. But um, I, I don't want to uh, lead this audience to believe that somehow any of those it has done the work for us and means that we don't still need a relative measure, which would, I think, learn from it and incorporate some of the principles of cost of living. 
And just one thing very briefly is that the government has to own a new measurement. Like it can't be up to nonprofit organizations or mm-hmm. economists or whatever that decide that they're going to make their own. It's, it's a shame that the government has an updated one. So I don't, I don't think it replaces a government run timely, relevant statistical model that is updated more frequently than it is now. Carolyn, are you working on any kind of action plan uh, to address your concerns? Um, I, I don't know. Action plan probably isn't the best word. I think I'm concerned about political feasibility. So, um, and just how how poverty measures are are talked about and used. Like we think about it in terms of connecting it to child and family well being among other things. Um, I, I do social policy research and I think about targeted programs and I think about the policy targets of those programs and how they've been socially constructed in a negative light through discourse. So I'm just thinking through the political feasibility of shifting you know, what we've done for the past however long to something that, that should be more generous and should create more equitable outcomes, what, what pitfalls might emerge. So I, I'm unfortunately, thinking through the problems and not necessarily coming up with the solutions, which is why we have a a great panel here that can speak to some of those. Can I say one self-serving thing? I first wrote about unconditional child cash allowances six years ago in Mm. the New York Times, and they got all kinds of hate mail about giving money to poor parents who are wasted on their own, uh, on their needs. But uh, I, pushed ahead, didn't work, think about political feasibility. This is not to pat myself on the back, I just, or, is it, or it is. And here we are with the expanded generous child tax credit. It's not perfect. We don't even know whether it will be permanent, but sometimes you just have to do things because you feel they're right. Uh, you'll have, I apologize for uh, patting myself on the back. Do we have any more uh, comments, Ellie? Yeah, I think, I think we have time for one last question. And that yeah, actually- if I if I could hop in there before Ellie asks another question, I want to just say I think Carolyn is is not alone here in having questions uh, about um, what the political feasibility of doing this would be. We might all be clear in trying the, and united as a panel in saying we know the OPM isn't doing it, folks. We need to do better. But I don't want to I don't want to have the rest of us leave some sort of um, illusion here that we think this is going to be like flipping a switch. I'm going to allude to an episode of the West Wing that people may remember when there was actually a discussion about, hey, not we're not actually doing, wing, yeah. we're not doing a great job of measuring poverty. And then, and then nobody wanted to be the president who was going to have poverty go up on their watch, or at least have that appear to be what's happening in the data. So I don't think it would, it would do us a service in this conversation to pretend that this is an easy road that any of us is suggesting we walk down politically, but we do have a real opportunity in this moment with President Biden and, and Vice President Harris is taking historic leaps forward in trying to redefine what it looks like for our society to care about our people um, and, and, and what it looks like for our social insurance infrastructure to be adequate. Um, this, this is in step with the American Rescue Plan, the American Families Plan, the American Jobs Plan in thinking big about getting it right on something we've been doing so wrong for so long. Well, uh... Are we, is it conclu- concluding time, Ellie? Um, I think we can probably fit in one more question because it's right in the vein as what Rebecca was just saying. Um, one person asked, we hear a lot about how the latest stimulus, stimulus cut child poverty in half. Can you touch a little bit on how that relates to different poverty measures and what that means? Could cut it in half. Who's that to, Rebecca? Throw that one to Emma. <laughs> I was just nodding like, yeah, that's a, yeah, Rebecca could do that. <laughs> Anyone could cut this. So yeah, the projections, um, I think a lot of different organizations and, and um, universities have done projections. A lot of them have been from Columbia University or friends over there at the Center of Poverty and Social Policy, um, or excuse me, I'm blanking on the name, but um, there were projections and they were projections on mostly the child tax credit um, that assume a 100% take up rate. So if families and children on the ground, even though they have extended eligibility, if they're actually not able to get the child tax credit, whether that's 
accessibility issues, whether that they don't file their taxes because they weren't aware of it, whether that's because the IRS refuses to put a uh, simplified online filing tool um, so families can sign up. There's gonna be a whole host of issues. I think what we're all concerned about is that in that in actuality, the child poverty won't be cut in half because we won't be able to realize that due to ex accessibility issues um, on the ground. Um, and I, I, I also think like the conversation on, the last thing I'll say is the conversation on those type of projections is really important in this conversation because we, at 200 or 300%, there's even, you know, more kids um, that would also benefit. And so if we only think of it as like everyone at 100%, um, and those projections are in, are in FPM, as I think I recall from Columbia, um, you know, again, I, I there's a lot of kids who are going to benefit at, a, at also at a moderate, lower to moderate incomes that are not currently captured in the conversation around poverty, which I think is related to this conversation today. And I, I hope I, I hope I answered that question fully as well. I think we need another uh, up. We need another hour or so to answer all these questions fully. Unfortunately, uh, should I wrap it up, Ellie? Where do we stand here? Yeah, if you could go ahead and take us home, I think we're about at time. Okay, well, uh, we have exceptional people on this panel, all of whom had exceptional ideas. David Brady, thank you for this important report. It can be found on the TCF website. Am I right, Emma? And uh, are, are we still on? And on the CEPR website, I think. Are we still on? Yes. Is Soleil there? Yes. You're still In on, any case, what, the message we have to leave you is when the government tells you how many poor people there are in America, it's not true. It's not even remotely close. It's much lower than the real count. And uh, we got to do something about it as a decent society. Counting the poor is uh, a measure of how decent America can be. And it hasn't been decent about poverty in a very long time. So we've got to take some action. We're going to try to come up with some action plans. Uh, we're going to keep our own uh, little center on poverty measurement going. Uh, and we'll keep you informed about the next webinar and some of our next publications. Again, David, thanks very much. Uh, and all the panelists were exceptional. Uh, and Ellie, thank you, as always, for helping to put this together. Thanks, Jeff.